Go ahead. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone in those for the students to come to the presentation on methodology review. I'm going to uh, be discussing today an aspect that is extremely important about research. One thing that I strongly encourage students to read when we are dealing with methodology, methods, it's this book by uh, Michael Crott, it's called The Foundations of Social Research. Particularly, even the entire book, but particularly the, the first uh, chapters. And the first chapters explain the difference between three things that I think a lot of people are very confused with. Methodology, methods, and two other concepts that come out along with it, and they're very important, which are called theoretical perspective, or the philosophy of it, and epistemology. In order to get to the methodology, we need to understand all these concepts up together. Epistemology deals with the notion of knowledge. It's the science of knowledge, it's the field of study of knowledge. What, in the question usually for every, what is the epistemological question? In other words, what is it that you are trying to produce, a piece of knowledge? Research is the production of knowledge. And that has to do with the, what kind of knowledge you're going to produce as a result of the research study that you want to do. The theoretical perspective refers to the inkling of the researchers, the desire of the researchers to do certain type of study. And Crotty defines that as the philosophical stance informing the methodology and thus providing a context for the process and grounding its logic and criteria. So before you start doing a kind of study, you need to know what is it the knowledge, and the knowledge is a result of the question. And the study determines what kind of knowledge you can do. The theoretical perspective, the philosophical stand, what you believe is valid knowledge. What is it that it makes something true knowledge? And then we have these two words, often, very often confused in the literature. And methodology refers to the strategy, as Crotty defines, that's what I read it, the plan of action, process or design, lying behind the choice and use of particular methods and linking the choice and the use of methods to the desired outcomes. So, in other words, methodology is the plan of action. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? The general view of what's the plan, what is the, the diagram for this study? And the question comes in, so what is method? Is methodology is the plan of action? What is method? Method refers to the techniques and procedures used to gather and analyze data related to some research question or hypothesis. Is the techniques skills? So a lot of people ask, the methodology is your plan of action. For but these are the concepts. For instance, we talk about the understanding of day rate in college. I want to understand what is day rate in college for, let's say, African American women. That's the kind of knowledge I want to understand how women who are minority in majority large institutions, you know, experience the, 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 the experience or live the experience of being raped in college. How it affects them, particularly. We always need to narrow it down to the population. It, the more narrow our question is, the more likelihood we have of producing some type of answer 
that a small study can produce. And even though a dissertation is an extensive, in-depth, and profound study, it's still a small study. It's not a longitudinal study or a large-scale study because it's usually carried out by one person or it's part of a research team but it's still a one person. The theoretical perspective refers to the intent, the design, how knowledge is produced, right? Some scholars are more interested in the qualitative form of study. Some people are more towards the quantitative piece. They like to operationalize human experience. Therefore, they lean towards the quantification of knowledge. Other individuals lean more towards a narrative understanding of something. So your epistemological question, even though you is very specific, different scholars will approach in a different manner. And the knowledge produced will differ from both of them. And then after we have these things to sort out, we can talk about the methodology and the methods. As again, one more time, these two terms are very often confused. But if we follow Crotty's understanding, the methods are the techniques and skills, and the methodology is the plan of action. A lot of people talk about, I'm going to do interviews. Well, interviews is not necessarily a methodology, but actually it's a technique, it's a skill for gathering information. If we talk about the production of the narrative story that tells the experience of being raped, that's a methodology, because we're talking about stories. If we talk about the description of what it was like to be raped, that's a methodology. We're trying to figure it out something like it's a phenomenon. And methodology leads us to the different, since I have more verse in Polytech, give example, of different traditions or approaches of phenomenology, case study, uh, narrative inquiry, ethnography, and some other forms. So the methodology is a plan of action. So say, for instance, I'm going to carry interviews. That's a technique and a skill, but it's not a methodology. Or, for instance, to say, I'm doing a poll, and I'm going to poll people. Well, that's a form, it's a technique, it's a skill. But collecting information through the gathering of data is a plan of action. How is it going to be done? What is going to be done? That's what refers to methodology. And that's the topic of today's presentation. So within the research design, methodology is the arch, um, arch that encompasses everything. It's the umbrella. It's like a big umbrella we have. And each one of the little you know, things that hold the umbrella are the methods. Um, when we talk about methodology, we talk about the selection. Who are going to interview, in this case, African-American women? Where are we going to interview them? Or where are we going to collect information from them? Also, it's important to understand in the methodology, what are the assumptions? Assumptions we have about that. A plan of action always needs to tell us you know, what assumptions we're bringing into the study, particularly in qualitative research. And how are we going to do this during a semester long, a week long, at the end of a semester, throughout a year, throughout a month? It's very important to determine how information is going to be collected or data. Does that make sense? So that's what is very important to understand. A lot of people confuse methodology for method. And that's what you need to understand. The plan of action. How is our plan of action? A research design is usually what the methodology is. The whole plan of how we're going to go about it, with whom we're going to go about it, how we're going to access our participants, what are we going to ask them, what instrument, what tool, what service, what kind of question, open-ended, structure, semi-structure, etc., etc. And then we have the notion of how a research design is constructed. It is constructed based on the methodology, the things that we plan to use, do, and with whom and for whom. A research design needs to be thoroughly pondered upon, not just 
sketch, but ponder them. And this is a book that I strongly recommend for the students, Research Design, latest edition, which is the fourth edition by Cresco. Methodology is often also misunderstood in terms of what the research is supposed to do versus what a tradition tells you to do. For instance, if you, in a quantitative format, you want to do, apply a survey, a survey that talks about stress after rape or some other instrument that you identify with rape, just having an instrument is a technique. But how that instrument is going to be used refers to the methodology. The technical, philosophical, and epistemological aspects of the study need to be considered. So as I told you, a lot of people say, I'm going to interview people. That's not going to make you qualitative. How you want to use those interviews is what determines that it becomes qualitative or quantitative. Because interviews, conversation, opening question, polling can, be, can go both ways. So that's a lot of mistakes that people make. Also, what kind of knowledge you want to produce or present to others. So that's an aspect that needs to be considered. So a lot of people talk about techniques when in reality they need to discuss methodology. The research design needs to include discussion of the purpose of the instrument. So identifying an instrument, that, such as a questionnaire or a survey, it's not a methodology, but how it is going to be used and how the information obtained is going to be analyzed and presented, it's what really matters. Because you can also use a tool, such as a survey or a poll or a questionnaire, that you can transform it into mixed methods in which you present information both as a quantitative aspect of it as well as the qualitative aspect of it. So very important to differentiate that, it, such as uh, conversation, interviews, polls, surveys, questionnaires. They're techniques, but they're not a methodology. Also, in the research design, you need to discuss how each instrument is measured and what things can be said about the instrument and the population with whom the instrument is going to be used. In qualitative, saying, I'm going to have open-ended questions. Well, that's a methodology, but what kind of questions you will produce need to be stated before you enter the conversations. So you have a point of entry that is similar. You need to have simple questions that allow you to have uh, a latitude of what you are going to be asking and what aspect you will consider. Otherwise, an interview can be totally different from another interview and it will be tremendously difficult for you to tabulate that information, to, 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 collect, to not collect, but how to code that information when two interviews are completely different, given the fact that you didn't plan the type of question that you try to kind of ask everyone. Not always your plan will work that way, but open-ended doesn't mean that you have simple questions you would ask. The other thing is, give details of the reliability and validity of an instrument. Not all instruments serve the same purpose or will obtain the same information just because they refer to victims of rape. Variables need to be considered that are both extraneous and different from the study. That's why diversity issues are extremely important when using standardized testing. Also, asking one the same question to everyone may result in completely different information obtained from everyone. A lot of the extraneous variables is, is what we discuss in quantitative. In, um, in uh, quanti qualitative, we talk about truthfulness. Some things are completely different from person to person, even though we may use the same question or ask the same question in the same manner, with the same wording. Every individual will tell us their own truth about it. The other thing is that it's important that if you do quantitative, the validation of an instrument. An instrument needs to be validated. And there are various mathematical formulas, statistical formulas, to validate the level of variability, the possible types of errors you may find. For that, it's important to consult with uh, statisticians. 
a lot of students fail to do that, to consult with the statistician we're doing, applying certain instruments to determine the validity and the range of what is being said with that instrument. That is not done just with a discussion. This instrument was developed for you know women in general, but I'm going to use it with yes, that's a recognition of a limitation of the instrument which is proper and appropriate. However, if you're doing a quantitative study, you need to provide some mathematical uh, proof in development of how you have validated the methodology of that instrument, which a lot of people fail to do. They just provide the results and they mention that as a limitation. But there are statistical formulas to do that. That's why it's very highly recommended that students who are quantitative studies consult with statisticians. It's not my expertise, but it's a suggestion that is always given. For quantitative studies, triangulation is often the case in which a third party is used to check the interpretation of the information that's being, that was collected or is being collected. Triangulation that always occurs with a third individual party Sometimes it can be done with the same participants, going back to the participants and sharing with them the interpretation has been done about the conversation that has been had with them. Often it's conversation. Also, a third party can be used to look at the conversation and comparing how the researcher is summarizing the data and the summarization and communication of data and qualitative is usually referred as themes. Themes is a condensation of ideas that refer to a specific phenomenon. Themes are the threads of meaning identified about an experience that explain an experience. That's why it's an quantitative. So triangulation is a process. So it's not a mathematical process, but it is a process in which the scholar is able to assess whether the interpretation and the identification of the themes correspond to the phenomenon or the experience that he or she is investigating. Furthermore, one thing that also is important to ask for permission, certain instruments require written permission in, for usage in, uh, and manipulation. That's a very important aspect. In um, one thing that, uh, um, that we talk about a little bit is about the theoretical perspective it has to do with the personal leaning of a scholar that informs the methodology. And the personal leaning not only refers to the strength of a tool such as a survey or a questionnaire, or the relevance of certain questions for some experience, such as how, or how, what did you do after being raped? Or where were you when you were raped? Or how you're coping after being raped? But rather, it is the assumption that you bring to the study, the areas of comfort and discomfort, as well as the limitations of the scholars. Often the case is that we talk about the limitations of the scholar conducting the research found or require more in qualitative but also it needs to be present in quantitative. A scholar that is not well versed in the particular type of statistical analysis that he or she is being, she's doing, needs to acknowledge that. And a scholar who uses uh, the consultant services of a statistician needs to acknowledge that also within the study. Otherwise, the interpretation that's being done is not about the reporting of a generic tool when the, the tool, which could be a survey, a questionnaire, or some other form of tool, is not we was not developed for that population, or is being adjusted to a population for which this instrument has not been tested previously. So we need to consider that. Methodology requires a lot of things. Methodology also has to do with procedures, how things are being done. What is the protocol to follow? What comes first, second, and third? How the information is stored? How the information is processed? How the information is going to be presented? Not in quantitative, often the case is graph. But in a graph, you don't include everything that you have found, but rather what is relevant to the research question you have and the things that are relevant toward the answer of your question. 
It's very important. A lot of people fail to do that. They put everything in the graph, and the graph becomes very cumbersome with a lot of numbers. And some of those numbers are not relevant to the horse, the question that is uh, being answered. Or in other cases, the graphs are so succinct and so small that much of the information, the source of the information, and the wealth of it is lost. So you ha don't have to err in too much or too little, but rather always keep in mind the research question and how the research question can be answered. In terms of procedure, we can have some examples here, such as getting permission to access the population. Are the population uh, compensated, motivated in some form or fashion? How you are selecting the population? Where? the population is coming from, the location, how you will collect the information, how you will analyze the information of data, how you will ensure confidentiality, how would you provide informed consent, let's say for instance people who seem to second language, will you have translations, will you have translators, will you provide bilingual material, etc, etc. What are the steps involved in the interventions. And also one thing that is not here, but at the same time, will those who are not able to participate in your study have the opportunity to receive the treatment that you are offering to those who are willing to participate in the study with you? That's a very important aspect. Even though individuals that are not part of your study um, will not be included in your report, which is your dissertation, they also need to have the opportunity to receive the treatment that you provide to those who are, were willing at the time of the collection of the information or the data. That's an aspect that is often overlooked. In the IRB forms, you need to provide that information. For instance, you are providing a survey on, as we say, you know, day raping college. And some women are willing to talk about, they want to share that information. But some people don't have the time or cannot attend that particular session. Or if you are having, for instance, a conversation about the rape, you know, and you have a selection of people who chooses to be for, let's say, three, four, five, six sessions with you to discuss their experience so you can collect that information. It is a cathartic experience. And as such, individuals who might not attend those sessions, they also need to have the opportunity for them to come together in the confidential aspect to receive the information. That might be required from you, not always, but it's a consideration. Because if some people have the opportunity to have, in a confidential environment, the chance to share their experience, those who, for various reasons, might not attend, they also need to have the same opportunity to have this cathartic chance to express their feelings and their experiences. If you are doing an experiment, those who receive a treatment, a treatment to prove to be beneficial for some individuals, it cannot be refrained from, or you cannot refrain those who don't participate in the treatment, to have the opportunity after the study is concluded to have the benefit. Let's say you are going to do an intervention with one group about counseling strategies on how to cope with day rape, African American. And then you select the population and you provide the intervention, et cetera, et cetera, right? But there are some individuals who did not receive and you want to compare and contrast results, whether that particular counseling intervention, social intervention works. Those who did not receive the treatment also have the right to receive that treatment if it's considered beneficial to them. And you must provide that. It's an inconvenience for the research because you might not include that data in your study or might not be part of your study. Nevertheless, those individuals deserve the right and the capacity and the accessibility to those services too. Something that you need to include in the IRB forms. Sometimes you fail. You are very good about your control group, the people, your experimental, I mean the your experimental group, but you forget that your control group, those individuals who are not receiving the treatment, they also have the right to receive it. And while they are not going to be your study, they also must have the benefit that the others receive something that I tend to overlook in the methodology part. In terms of procedures, as I said, time is casual. And um, here we mentioned a little much. Therefore, you have to be very careful providing the same conditions 
two individuals who answer survey what they are not answered at the same time. Physical condition, space conditions, time conditions, stressors, etc., etc., etc. The other aspect of time that you need to consider for your study in the continuum is that a research study often occurs in a specific period of time. Research does not conclude at the moment you finish your data collection, or it does not start at the moment you begin your study, but it starts much earlier and finish much later than the study in itself for various reasons. Let's say this is January, February, March, this is April, uh, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and let's say December for the sake of it, right? While you may have the approval to do your study between April and August, let's say you're collecting data or doing interviews in the weather paradigms, your study begins way before that in terms of the preparation of the study, learning the literature, the information, the selection of participants. It is very important that when you refer to the methodology, you don't pick anybody who answers because that's about it. You need to be very purposeful about who or what population you are going to choose and how to access that population and when that is the best time to access that population. If you're doing a study in a university setting, we know that summer months usually are the low season when large number of students often are not taking classes. Therefore, you need much wider amount of time to reach students who are very likely or unlikely to be checking email, coming to campus, or be having the time to really do more work than they're really doing. Whereas with academic years, more likely that people are taking classes, are physically here, and they are available to take the time to answer your surveys or engage with your conversation if you're doing a qualitative study. The other thing, too, is in terms of the methodology, it's not only during the time that you're collecting your data that you actually need to plan, but you need to plan way ahead of time in terms of the procedure, protocol, IRB forms, material information. You don't, in a conversation, when you're doing qualitative, you don't start having the conversation with people for you to prepare how to do qualitative interviews. This is something that you do way before, and you ideally practice with peers, you record questions. That's why in your prospectus, you need to have actual questions as well as in your proposal. Simple questions that you will provide. At the same time, you, when doing the time that you are doing your data collection, let's say you are surveying people and asking people to survey, you need to have the accommodations provided for people to have, this is the room we're going to meet. These are the dates, these are the time. You don't expect during the time to have one room answering one question, another day another room, and then sometimes asking for a room. One people answer in a room with no noise, and other people answer in the hallway, other people answer in it. That has to do with methodology, how you plan that. You need to have as much as possible the similar, even if it's quantitative, the same physical and temporal conditions. And that is planned ahead of time. The other thing too is, in terms of time, while often the case is you're planning to have two months to collect your data, always double the amount of time, the amount of effort, and the amount of resources for research. Most people think that they're going to be done in one year. Most people take at least two years. People don't answer it. Or people who answer don't answer all the surveys or you get too many women, too many men, too many particular people, and your sample population is absolutely not reflected from the general population. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing, sometimes it's bad planning. So the time factor within research is extremely important. It affects the information you collect, the data you collect, and who you access within your study. So time is not just like, oh, it's going to take me two weeks to, to, uh, to answer that. You always need to plan twice as much time. 
you always need to consider the availability of time for those who are taking the surveys, questionnaires, or when you're doing conversations. Some, for instance, in qualitative, often the case people want to do two rounds of conversation and be done. Often that's not the case. You might need at least three times. In my personal research, even though it was very specific, I still needed three rounds of conversation. One round of conversation was to inform each and every one of the participants what the study was about. When I sent the form, I sent a letter in the invitation by email, still I needed to talk to people to let them know about what the study was about and was not about. Second, while I have these two interviews with everyone, very extensive, an hour and a half up to two hours and a half, which each participant around two times, that I, I saw the need to have a general meeting and my third round of interview was with everyone. In order to control what I was saying was actually or getting was actually what the students identified with. Those themes really talked to them and they saw themselves in those themes and it was not just me trying to create information the way I wanted. So I needed to have and I read in my third round of interview was with them asking them, this is what I've got, this is what some paragraph. And some students, oh my God, that's me, even though I changed their name, they could see themselves and go, oh my God, that's me, that's how I felt. Is that me? And so, yeah, that's you. Yeah, that's what I mean. How many participants did you have? I had, in my study, there were uh, eight. So I didn't have to see but I had to have, instead of two, there were three. Three rounds of interviews. And there was a special conversation with one of them because I only have two males, two out of eight. So there was something to be said about males. And there was a theme, even though my study was about those who benefit from being in a peer mentoring experience as mentees, recipient, there was something to be said about those who weren't there, those who did not choose or did not stay with a mentoring program from where my participants came from. So there was a theme about those who were absent that I needed to uncover and reveal what they saw in the experience that kept them and what they thought and considered would have not kept them for those who did not choose to participate. That was an interesting, that was a theme that was completely, I just wanted to say what it was like to be a PMT as a Latino. But the study also required me to understand what some Latinos felt that did not talk to them or appeal to them or motivated them to stay in that. In order to know what it is to be in, I needed to know what it felt like or they saw, they thought it would have been not to be in. So for me to explain better what it means to be a mentee, what it benefits, obtains, because even if it were obtained, I needed to understand what it was for them not to, what it would have been if we didn't get this, they would have been absent from the program, or not stay with the program, or not continue with the program. So that not being an MT was also something that I needed to understand in order to explain what my research question was. What is it like the lived experience of Latino PRMTs in a public institution of higher education? And my topic was about those who were, or those who were not were. The other thing about timing is, and your methodology, you need to understand that you might be interested in two months of, but this usually is the double of time. The analysis, the processing of data and all that, is much longer than initially anticipated. While you have a timeline, and Fresco is very good about creating a timeline, it's very good to have a timeline. But you have to often understand that it will be much longer than initially anticipated. You, for instance, may say, I want to collect information from, um, let's say, you're talking about April to July, June, because I need to get this class I'm defending in December. But it might be the case that in order to have enough number of participants, or reach all the type of participants you want, for instance, trying to have a balance representing the public, you might to extend this until August. I don't, I don't know if this is a, well, I think the question is appropriate. I don't know if it's the right time to ask it or not, but uh, you mentioned Creswell, and you were talking about assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, one of his books, uh, 
I don't know if it's the same one as a reprint or not, but he talks about rhetorical assumptions. Mm -hmm. And I, that confuses me because according to him, he says that when you talk about rhetorical assumptions, you're using the language of the research. And oftentimes the research is not speaking from third person to first person using a proper. That's a quality. I mean, that, that, okay, but it's, quali it's qualitative, but I'm doing a mixed methods, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, the reason I got, I got, I got in, into that was because my topic, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy in word definitions. They use, different people use the same word to mean different things. That's always the case. So, when I look at the rhetorical assumption, I didn't know if that was applicable because when they said the language of research, well, I thought they would say, well, there's certain language that is associated with my research. So I'm wondering, are they talking about that language or are they talking about specific research language? I'm, because when I'm, when I'm in my perspective, I'm trying to incorporate the rhetorical assumption, but I want to make sure I have the correct understanding of it. Am I making sense? Yes. We talked about that earlier, remember, with the theoretical, that's what I said. Oh, suggest. today, today you talked about, I'm sorry. We talked about, <laughs> okay. We talk, it was okay, we talked about this textbook, the difference between method methodology, theoretical perspective, and epistemology. Remember, by you choosing to do mixed methods, you are using a particular type of paradigm. And as I said to you, one of the things earlier, often the case is, in order to use a paradigm, the most cases, most institutions require that you use, you take two classes, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say qualitative and then the specific, the specific quali qualitative. But often is the case you need to take at least four classes to specialize in the methodology way before you enter into your study. Because while even though sometimes various authors use similar words or the same words, the interpretations of those words and how those words are meant to be used within them changes from a scholar to a scholar. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you need to be clear when you say, yeah, I think this is the book. One of the first things you need to know, which book and which author and in which year? I know it's 2007 Creswell. Mm -hmm. and, which one? And which? It's the 2007 book. And is that book there? Well, this is same, 2014. It's the same title. It's, the same title. it's uh, 2014. So I mean, was the one before that. But it's the one. It's one. It's the, it's the one before. It's the one before that. But it's, it's changes are occurring. Cresswell, his thinking has changed, and all the new textbooks have intrinsic changes. So they are not reprints. For instance, in his classical book, I have it here with me, of uh, research, uh, he talks about uh, the five types of qualitative uh, traditions. Traditions interpret them as a specific lines of thinking. In the 2013 edition, he changes into five approaches, recognizing that research is done through an approach that often is mixed with other formats of interpretation. Therefore, when you are asking, you need to have a clarification of which author you are following and what particular interpretation of that terminology is being done. So that is the first, is the start of your answer to your question. Okay. Which author, in which year? Because authors change their way of thinking, or they, even within authors. Oh. So you have to make a decision, an executive decision of which author you're following and what a specific interpretation you will be using according to the research question you have. Okay. And that's the arbitrariness of research that your interpretation is interpretation you are capable of producing, understanding that other interpretations can be also possible and doable and viable, and sometimes perhaps even better interpretations can come along the way about the same subject. Mm -hmm. And I'm quoting Van Manet. Okay. Therefore, your job before, and as we're talking about methodology, is to be well versed in the methodology. Your scholars, your authors, and your theoretical perspective. So once you enter into the study, you abide by the, the, the theorists that will guide your study. 
and if you tend, if by any chance you tend to differ from them, then you need to present the rationale for your reinterpretation of concepts, ideas, methods, techniques. Because that's something that was causing me uh, concern too. I was looking at this the other night, and when I started looking at um, worldviews, and I, I started off and I said, well, the post-positivist, -posit post-positivism. Yes. Okay, so I thought that was appropriate because I'm, because I'm dealing with mixed, mixed methods, so you know, that, that lends to the mixed method quantitative approach, okay? But then when I started to read, and I started looking, I said, well, look at the constructivists. Well, I kind of want to do that too. And then I looked at it further, and I said, well, hmm, I, I'm also a, a, a participant. So there were like maybe three or four different worldviews that I'm, I plan to apply. So now I'm saying, well, so would that make my, my, my approach alternative or I don't know if you understand world views well. World views are particular ways how you produce knowledge. How knowledge is recognized as valid. Yeah. Therefore, it is always recommendable, advisable that you use one particular world view. Otherwise, the study becomes extremely complex. You don't have the luxury to include too many paradigms within a study. Okay. And it is your research question that leads the search for information. It is the research question that determines what you need to do and what decisions you make in order to answer the research question. Mm. So maybe I'll be confused about worldviews and paradigm. Those are ways of production, ways in which knowledge is produced. But you need to be aware that the research question is the one that leads what kind of answer can be given in order to answer that question. At the same time, producing a mixed method study is far more complex than using a particular type of method. So your research question demands the use of mixed method. It's not necessarily that you want to do it. It's a question that requires mixed methods. So your question needs to be tailored and altered in a way that a research method that is mixed can be answered. My, 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 my basic question is something like, what are the major factors? What are the major factors that parents in the District of Columbia use when selecting alternative school choices for their children? Mm -hmm. And what I'm, based on the theory, parental choice theory that by introducing the um, market concept uh, you will increase uh, competition which in turn will cause everybody to improve and that parents have the wherewithal to make rational decisions in assessing the schools. So, so, so that's 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 basically what I'm trying to see: whether or not parents are actually making rational decisions in their selection of school choice. Yeah. The the job that you need to do after you present that it's what it needs to be done in a mixed method, that it cannot be answered in a qualitative format or a quantitative format? Well, the reason I thought it was mixed methods is because you have an evaluation. What do scholars say about mixed methods? What is mixed methods? What is the theoretical foundation? You know, we talk, today we're talking about methodology. So what is the definition of a mixed method study? Well, I, I would say a mixed method. Remember, it doesn't come from you, it comes from scholars. Which scholar you are quoting in order to justify the use of mixed methods? Okay. The only scholar that I am really familiar with is Creswell. Okay. What does Creswell say for the rationale of the use of a mixed method? Mixed methods is it, it, it used to satisfy um, 
uh, um, people who have a empirical or a empirical background, or people who deal with uh, the scientific method, or we're used to the scientific method, or if I'm dealing with, um, say, like a funding agency. No, but what does this what does what is, Chris what? will say? You have to go first with the scholar, and the line of thinking of the scholar to far to, for the foundation. Okay, okay of the so I, I, okay, I, I, I think what he says that myth method is the use of qualitative and qualitative approaches to research to verify. Um, well, this is a very good book that I strongly recommend to people. So what is the connection between the mixed method and, uh, and your study? What is it that it requi your study requires the use of mixing two different methods? Because because one, I want to get, I, I'm looking for a, a, a better understanding of the, of the process that parents use in selection, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I, need, I think I need the quantitative part of it because I need empirical evidence to support the, uh, okay. the feelings. That's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to see if the empirical evidence supports the, uh, the, the uh, decisions. Okay. Yeah. Here on page 14 of the latest edition, it says here, mixed method designs, you know, involves combining or integrating qualitative and quantitative research and data in a research study, okay? Qualitative data tends to be open-ended without predetermined responses, while quantitative data usually include close-ended responses, such as found on questionnaires or psychological instruments. So what instrument? are you using that requires the use of a qualitative approach after results are found? I don't know if I understand that. I don't know if I understand. Okay, I don't understand. It says here, quality tends to be open-ended without predetermined responses, right? Right. While quantitative data usually includes closed-ended responses such as found in questionnaires and psychological instruments. So in order to justify the use of a quantitative approach for a study, right. you need to identify an survey. instrument, a uh, tool. Survey, survey, okay. One thing I was going to use was survey. Which survey are you using and why the survey requires the use of qualitative analysis after the results are used? Okay, now one survey I meant was the Epstein family. I but I, I don't know, I mean, I'm not familiar with that, but the question that you need to consider is what is insufficient or inconclusive about that survey for your research question that you need to use in these methods? Okay, okay, so why? Why? Mm -hmm. That's what. So anyway, to wrap up there, I'm just going over that. Methodology, as I said to you before, and I quote Crotty, refers to the strategy, plan of action, processes of design, lying behind the choice and use of a particular method, and the linkage that, that choice makes to the use of methods in order to reach the desired outcomes in relation to a research question. Not to be confused with what the word methods imply, which is the techniques and procedures used to gather and analyze data related to some research question or hypothesis. In your <coughs> case, I would strongly suggest that you read some, read uh, Creswell, the latest yes. edition, yes, the latest this is the edition. Latest edition. This is the latest. Yes, and at the same time, you read more about the philosophical foundation for uh, mixed methods. Because you need to answer that question before you present your study. Okay. Well, you know, I I, I, I hear you, and I and I take I, I, I hear you, and I understand what you're saying. Uh, one of the things that one of the things that made me think about using mixed methods too was the fact that there was a theory associated with parental choice. So I figured since I was testing the theory, that would that would mean I would have to use quantitative uh, approaches to some question question of theory. But also want to go beyond the theory and look forward. That's the part that you need to articulate within your study. Okay. What is the deficiency? What is the need to go beyond the information of a certain tool? 
it is found, I mean, what it has, so it justifies the and Because remember, what mixed metal is kind of doing two studies in one. But why do you need to do two studies in one? That's the rationale you need to have. And at the same time, you need to clear, have a clear from the your scholars before you do the study. So in summary, that was the presentation for the development methodology. Remember, this is a small piece of the process. As I mentioned before, people should understand that research is start the first day of your doctoral program. This is not done in two classes either. Students should have at least four classes in the type of paradigm they want to develop. At the same time, things that are not written in stone, but a study required, you should have at least over 100 articles for a dissertation. And you should have over 20 books for a dissertation. It's not written in stone, but you need to have an approximation of 100 articles that you need to discuss and talk about. Some of them will be included in your dissertation, some are not. For that, you should review 200, 300, 400 articles. Not everything you select will be included in your dissertation. But you need to have a very clear understanding of literature way before, and that begins in your prospectus. As a rule of thumb, this is not going to You should have a selection of over 100 articles and a kind of an average of 20 books, referee books, ideally unless it's a strongly justified why you're using some other book. So that's kind of things that you need to think about. What is the plan of action? What is the timeline of your study? As I said to you, a dissertation usually talks and takes an average of three years. You don't, yes, because a dissertation is a piece of document that is mature. You don't start the last year of classes. You don't choose your committee at that time. You don't choose your chair. But you start writing your research proposal the very first day you are in the program. 50% of your interview when you apply for is about your research. Also, remember that you may be invited or required to take additional classes beyond the required classes because of the methodology and the research point that you are taking. Not always those classes will be offered in the campus where you are taking your, or doing your doctorate. You might have to go to other institutions to specialize. But above all, everything is according to your chair. Your chair is the main research investigator. But some things you need to do on your own. So.